Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Supply Chain Expert Panel. My name is Tuba Kacikoc, and I am the Vice President of Strategic Programs here at QuickBase. Today, we will talk about how current events are sh shaping technology trends. And I am excited to host three supply chain leaders. Before we start, I would like to go around Zoom and ask our panelists to introduce themselves. Let's start with Raul Granados from Schneider Electric. Raul? Hello, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm the director of global cost and analytics for Schneider Electric, uh, which employs 135,000 people in 100 countries around the world. And we have a yearly revenue of 25 billion. Um, I have 17 years of expertise on procurement, majority of specialization in procurement strategy, international negotiation, global category management and, and leadership and mentorship of global procurement teams. So I consider my work vision to incorporate all the elements, negotiation, finance, should cost and digital skills with the algorithms to support productivity, execution and strategy. For the past three years, I've been leading a um, procurement digital transformation project in Schneider uh, using QuickBex technology. Thanks, Raul, and welcome to our panel. Our next panelist is Gino Stone from Daifiku. Gino. Thank you for the invitation today. My name is Gino Stone. I'm the Vice President of Advanced Automation Execution for Daifuku. Daifuku is the world's largest material handling company. We're responsible for many of the fully automated warehouses that you'll see around the world. Um, my team in particular is responsible for executing all of the advanced automation projects with robotics and ASRS and advanced software packages uh, throughout the US. Thanks, Gino. Great to have you here. And we have Martin Weiss from McKinsey. Martin? Yeah, thank you for the invitation to that. Great to be here with this great panel. And uh, I'm a partner in McKinsey and Company based in Switzerland in Europe. And I'm focusing on digital transformations uh, for supply chain management, as well as for back office functions. And happy to be with you with the panel. Thanks, Martin, for being with us today. Let's get started. We regularly conduct research, survey ch supply chain professionals, and follow the media. From a media perspective, we have seen visibility, and resiliency take over headlines in the supply chain space. And I'm wondering what these terms mean to you. Gino, would you like to open the conversation? Yeah, sure. You know, as I, as I think about this question more and more, the, you know, it reminds me of this concept of VUCA that's so real in the world that we live in today. And, and VUCA is the reality that everything we have is variable, um, uncertain, you know, um, uh, uh, full of change and ambiguity and, and everything around us is full of, of this variability. And, and the only way that you can really adapt to this world that we're in is by thinking of ways to plan ahead and thinking and of ways to react more quickly. It really resonates with what we have seen over the uh, last year, right? VUCA. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, the world that we live in is just variable and, and, Every time you think you've got a handle on the things that you're dealing with, another thing pops up. And unfortunately, it's not gonna stop. So the other thing that you know, we really think about when we talk about VUCA is how can I react more quickly or how can I get as much information to act as soon as I possibly can? And that's one of the great ways that we're utilizing QuickBase in our operation is to, to find ways to react to problems sooner and to give us that advanced notice of, of a problem coming up and to help us um, increase reaction time. Uh, recently with some of the freight challenges that we've had throughout the, throughout the US, you know, we have projects um, that we're expecting containers to come in and they may come in two or three months later than, than anticipated. Uh, that's just the reality. And unfortunately there's nothing we can do about it to change that reality. So building processes and teams that have the information they need to change quickly it is so crucial in what we're doing today. Thank you for sharing your perspectives. <clears throat> Raul, how about you? Like what do you have, have you, what have you experienced over the last year? Yeah, I think uh, when talking about resilience, right? Um, 
this means to me as a company that we need to anticipate the changes and to react to the market very quickly and having alternatives for that. Um, and, and for that, really it visibly. possible? Like what do supply chain leaders do to, to make it happen? Well, uh, as I think that we are living now the perfect storm in procurement, right? The, there is a, a very, uh, in very complex situation right now from many fronts. And you need visibility, as you mentioned the word, right? To, to enable that reaction into the supply chain organization and to free up time of people so that people can react to those changes. It's not humanly possible to do everything right now. It's a it's hard time for procurement, right? So when when we talk about the word resiliency, to me, to me is being able to to react to those changes in a in the best possible way with the resources that we have. And you know, it it comes with technology. To me, it's, it, it needs to be something that we were not prepared for as a company or as a, as, a, um, um, as a society. And we need to create tools very quickly to react to those things. And Martin, how about your client base? What have you observed? Yeah, first of all, this pandemic has been an unprecedented event. This clear for everybody here in the room. And I think that's clear for everybody who was working on a supply chain. Then there were other events like the ship got stuck in the Suez Canal. So where as a supply chain leader, you always thought about, ah, we need to have an alternative. And for me, resilience is really to have alternatives. So we ask our clients and they plan with three to four scenarios to really come out of this pandemic. For each business unit or geography, their supply chain sits in and they really start to plan alternative supply chain setups in each scenario and execute it on it. So visibility is really powered by analytics. Visibility and traceability and flexibility are the key discussion points I have with my clients at the moment. Thanks for sharing. And you mentioned uh, COVID as well as um, the ship being stuck in the Suez Canal. And also there, has, there have been other events over the last year, right? Semiconductor shortages, container vessel shortages, port strikes. And these all had impact on different businesses. Have your organizations seen those impacts over the last year? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think every company has been impacted directly or in, indirectly by those um, by, by those changes, right? We have, uh, as I said before, the perfect storm where we have semiconductor shortages that are affecting uh, many uh, industries. We also have a high demand of copper in the industry. We have the electric vehicle picking up. And, and just as, as comparison, right, in demand that we have a, a car that uses 25 kilograms of copper. Now we have a combustion engine car. Now we have EVs that are using 85 kilograms of copper. So the shortage that is coming, it's, it's not going to, to, um, to go away for the next few years. And I think the pandemic was, in my opinion, probably in the perfect time where we, need to react to those changes more quickly. I think it was kind of a, a wake up call for all the procurement organizations where you need to you need to understand that you cannot be prepared for uncertainty. As Gino said, it's, it's something that you need to live every day, but you can be prepared to be resilient, to be, you can prepare to create something in that moment. What do you need? We don't know, right? So we need to create something that helps, a tool that helps to that situation. And, uh, and we don't know what is coming, right? Today, semiconductor issues, copper, uh, logistics issues. Um, we don't know what's going to happen in the next six months or a year. We, we learned that the hard way. So true. Gino, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I love this idea of the perfect storm, right? Because it's so true that just as demand is increasing, the challenges are kind of like increasing at an equal pace to meet it. <laughs> 
with with the pandemic, you know, everybody transitioned to from uh, the retail world to the e-commerce world, and that's driven a lot of our customers to say, you know, to reevaluate their e-commerce presence and to to think about ways to satisfy this customer demand. And 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 at the same time, you know, we have these massive shortages of of not only raw materials, raw like you were talking about, but even in the infrastructure that's needed to bring those raw materials to the US. Um, we deal with a lot of different freight carriers and moving stuff from Japan to the US and finding space on vessels today is almost impossible. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. You know, I, I think I had somebody uh, tell me that I needed to plan ahead by two or three weeks the other day and, and we're already planning ahead by two or three months <laughs> to get things onto vessels. and. And every company in the U.S. is fighting for this space. I mean, I've been told that Boeing is taking space. I've been told that Microsoft is taking space. And I've always been reminded that PlayStation 5 still isn't available in the U.S. for anybody to purchase. <laughs> which, is, which is, And Gino, which is, and Gino, these alternatives are super costly, I expect. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so, I mean, if, if, you, if, if, if you really want to wanna find alternatives to plan three months ahead, that is... Uh, I think coming at an expensive price tag. Yeah? It is. And if you need anything right now, you know, we're so used to this immediate service, right? To the, I need it. So I order it and Amazon brings it tomorrow or Amazon brings it in two days. And that reality comes with a cost. And now people don't really understand that in order to satisfy that need, you're planning four or five, six months ahead to make these things happen. Uh, Martin, I think you and you and I talked a, long, or a while ago, you brought up the example of an e-bike <laughs> and it's, it's so true. <laughs> it's just not a priority for shipping companies. And, and for us, it's especially hard because it's not just supply, but I need every single part of thousands of different parts to put a system together. And if one container out of a hundred is missing, the whole thing doesn't work. And it's, yeah. it's an amazing effort to make that happen. It's important also uh, to, to mention the, the little positives that we have right now, because this, this problem, this big problem that we have is pushing us to be more, to be faster. And as an example, in the past, when you want to qualify something in, a, in the industry that I know of for all my career is, it's difficult to qualify because it's a product that works, it's a product that is protecting people at the end of the day. And we need to be very cautious about uh, re-qualifying the, the product, right? So based on that concept, sometimes engineering gets slower to what they would. So now with this pandemic or these shortages of material and using techniques of analytics, then you can put those alternatives very quickly on the table because now the option is not to produce product, right? or qualify the part faster. So this is one of the very um, unique, small, small bright sides of what is happening. That is, we need to find a way of using those materials that are out there in the market that we were not, be using, we were not using before or create a project was very difficult, right? So now we need this, uh, as I say, this little tool that help you to find those materials quickly and put it in front of the engineers so that they can do their work, right? And we can ship product out, out of the door. It's and amazing. Ra Raul, what you just <clears throat> say is, I mean, you guys became agile. <laughs> so in the end, which is exactly. great, which is a That's great true. use. Just, just because, I mean, agile is really, I see so many clients now really engaging in, into more agile ways of working in procurement. I see sprints, I see task forces, solving problems, solving supply problems in a very agile way. And, and, and um, so, so my view on this is uh, technology can just as, act as a control center for, you know, for some of these task forces, yeah? And pro technology can also provide you better insights, KPIs into some of the shortages you see, some of the KPIs you want to track and some stuff you want to get on top of it. Yeah. So, and I think, I mean, what you described guys is just a very agile way of solving these problems. 
Yeah, I think all innovation and new ways of working come when you know companies or people are in tough times, right? Sure, that's right. Exactly so, right. Martin, you mentioned technology. Let's talk about technology a little more. And um, we talk about all these disruptions and you all mentioned it's important to respond and adjust quickly when these disruptions happen. And studies show in the event of disruption, um, about 40% of supply chain professionals say manual processes are the main contributor to slow reaction times. And um, additional 20% say disconnected systems mm. are the main problems. So do you agree with this? Yeah, uh, I take more. So I, I, I totally agree with the, the those statistics, right? Um, I, I believe that there is some, uh, the, the big elephant on the room right now is that the companies are very well prepared with very robust systems, right? To, system that control operations, control supply chain. But we need to be also very introspective that we are not prepared into these satellite tools and we are not agile to produce these satellite tools that can help to solve this kind of problem. So to me, there is one thing in perspective. There is no such thing as all connected systems. I think it's a, it's a myth, right? We are always producing more information to what we can digitize. That will continue to happen because we use uh, tools that are manual. All the, the people is using information on their computers, on the cloud. Some people think that putting it in the cloud is digitizing. That's not digitizing. You're creating more to what you can, what you can digitize. The, the, the trick here, or why we need to work together inside the, our companies and our industry is to connect one system or let people lose to put information by themselves when they need it to obtain the information that they that they require. It's not like some people working in silos or systems that are all the information need to be there and needs to be digitized. That's a myth. I think organizations, big organizations like Google, like Facebook, like many others, they what they did is to open a system. And people is putting their pictures, is putting everything by themselves, and this collabor this collaboration. Uh, causes that their databases are being fulfilled and you know the monsters that they have right now. It's it's something amazing, right? Why are we not doing that in, in our companies, right? We, we need to have this um, machine where we can put something and get something in return because the motivation of people is to get something in return very quickly. And we're not designing the system to be working like, like humans, right? This is what, oh, you need to put a system because we need the vice presidents to have the dashboard. I'm not getting any return out of that, right? I, I know that I need to present. We all need to have those presentations and everything, but what about helping the people in the front line? Currently, the best gift you can be, give to procurement people is to send them home early. It's tough times for, for the people in the front lines of procurement. So to me, I, I think um, these reaction times comes from the fact not from the big systems, but from the tools that we're giving people to work in the procurement organization. Yeah, you know, I, to add on to what Raul was saying, that, that idea that we create visibility for people, that we find ways to, to bring information out and to make it so they don't have to go ask for information is so key. You know, when you're in the middle of a firefight, the last thing you want to do is wait for somebody's email response to a question that you have, <laughs> right? You need an answer and you need an answer now because you may be missing a window that's so critical for your production or so critical for achieving, you know, getting on, getting uh, the right part to the right people at the right time. And, and I mean, we measure potentially loss in tens of thousands of dollars a minute on some of our projects. And so every minute counts. And so the more we can bring that information forward, the better it is. Uh, you know, I, I'm amazed when I look at a lot of the processes that our company has and other companies have and how much is done in spreadsheets and how much is still done, you know, in, and, and I consider a spreadsheet a manual process. You know, it's not connected to anything. It's, it, it's, it's pretty much a one-off and people are using those types of singular non-scalable processes to do amazing things. 
it's a great place to prototype, but if you're going to build a company with hundreds of people trying to do the same thing and you're going to scale it, a, you know, the databases are really the only way to get that type of visibility across your organization and make it so people can access it. Now, you know, we used to, we used to manage all of our bills of material at the BOM level, <laughs> and we've gotten down to the part level now where I want to see every part on every bill of material and its status because there's always gonna be one that's a problem. And if we don't have that magic part, it could create havoc throughout our entire organization. It creates havoc for our customers because they're expecting something to come online to be able to fulfill customer orders at a specific time. And missing one thing will just, the whole house of cards falls down at that point. So that visibility, right? That ability to see things is the key yeah. for us. Sorry, Martin. No, fully, fully agree, Chito. Spreadsheets are optimizing your own workplace, but they are not good for collaboration. No? So, so I, I mean, to what you just mentioned, 40% of the disruption comes from manual work, which is right, and 20% comes from maybe disconnected it's systems and, yes. and spreadsheets. Disconnect systems, <laughs> yeah? so, because it's only, only for you for your department maybe, yeah? Or maybe for your unit, but it's not good for collaboration. And this, this whole notion comes, comes to, to a bigger wave of disruption when you are in a transversal supply chain where you have contract manufacturing outsourcers, where you have third party logistics providers, where you have third parties involved in your supply chain. Then, then this whole disruption wave, what we see, is 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 swinging even even bigger and and is really having a higher magnitude, just because the disruption you create with your Excel files is creating a disruption in your third party supplier, and and this is something we really want to tackle, uh, just because, I mean, uh, the increasing magnitude of disruption from party to party in a supply chain is basically killing the supply chain. So I don't know if you have ever, you know, we, we talked about that when, when we had yeah. another discussion. Actually, you, I have a question. Sorry, yes, Martin, yeah. I'm interrupting you, sure. but related to this, have you seen the technology prior priorities changing over the uh, last year? No, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So my client starts started to work with interaction tools like Zoom, Slack, Teams, and uh, Miro, you know, just, just to make it happen, just to make the work from home uh, situation uh, happen. But, but now it's all about really collaboration in terms collaboration. of databases, collaboration in terms of not only sharing content, but also working together on content. Uh, you can, I mean, the, the basics is you work on a certain joint documents where Microsoft SharePoint is great, for example, but, you know, it's not interactive. It's not that you can, can really do analytics on this. Yeah. So, so, and if you are in the task force mode, coming back to the traceability, visibility of the supply chain and agility of a supply chain. You really need to think through, how do I make Kanban management happen? How do I do all these check-ins, check-outs, collaboration modes happening in a remote setup with Zoom only? Maybe not, yeah? So how can I use access to my databases? And there is really, you know, kind of um, where I see, I see some of these platforms, the local platforms, really coming into place where you have analytics via local tools being in place, where you try to really be more agile with Slack on your stand-up meetings. And these changes will stick around. Uh, so yeah. COVID is over soon, hopefully, in most of the we all hope, countries yeah. we operate, the country I live in, the country you live in, I think we are on a good path There are other countries where my, some of my, you know, really fellow colleagues live in, which are really in the middle of the disaster. But nevertheless, 
they will cope with it and they will overcome it and they will go back to the offices. And let's see how they will go back to the offices. These changes will stick around collaboration via uh, platforms and also collaboration via new ways of working. Yeah, and I, I can add to that, uh, looking at a little bit of my perspective as a uh, global tool cost, right? We, we work to make sure that the cost is optimum for the, for the parts. And we manage a lot of algorithms that depend <clears throat> from the market situation, from the quantities changing from, I will say 100 variables that are uh, changing every day, interest rates, um, exchange rates, right? All of that and handling so big amount of information, it's impossible to refresh, right? So the, the, the priorities, as you mentioned, how they are changing is that every single concept that we are now industrializing in the company is connected to all the variables. That's a standardization, right? Everything, if something is moving, the result is moving here. So the procurement team do not need to enter any information. That's, that's the beauty, right? We don't want people to be spending time putting information into the system because it's manual information, right? We want that to depend on the variables and, and the, the coming from the system, connecting databases and all. Because I, I'm a, uh, a very um, enthusiast people of making robots at home, right? And, and stuff like that. And sometimes you are doing something and then you go into the internet and the product already existed, right? And you feel a little bit disappointed on that. It's, it's the same happening in the digital, in the digital world. I think people is trying to build systems that when they look at something that is already doing that. So you need to be more creative into the tools that you are doing to the, to the company, not just to put everything that everybody has, because that can be commercially, it could become a commodity on the digital market. You need to create innovation that actually is tailor made to the procurement organization and to the way that each company is um, structured. And that's, a, that's an art, right? It's, you need to do something that it's compatible with the culture of the company. And the big systems are not prepared to do that. So in, in the, from my point of view, in, in the priority, we need to prepare the systems to interact with the technology that is coming more and more, such as machine learning, such as AI. And if we don't prepare the database and the architecture of that, to interact with those systems in the future, the system will die and very quickly and very badly, right? So we, we really need to be a little bit more creative, a little bit more innovative, uh, thinking a little bit about the future and the, and the company needs. It's like a continuous improvement mindset, right? Where you're constantly thinking about new ways to improve your process and new ways to do it differently and better. Because if you stop thinking about it, you become stagnant and, and there's just no, you're gonna get so far behind the curve that to catch up, you've now got to undertake this massive effort. And so finding that way to just, you know, take the little bites constantly and do constant change is, is really crucial, I think, to maintaining that, you know, that agile mindset and maintaining your, your position as an agile company, so crucial. Yeah, and adding one more comment there is I see quick pace um, technology as a addi additive manufacturing, right? And is you have a, a 3D printer at home or at your work that you can do and destroy stuff and, and you can test and fail, but you can do it yourself, right? You can do the changes. You can, you can say, okay, it works. It not, doesn't work. You, do, you build a prototype. You can present a prototype to management, not, not a, just a PowerPoint or a, a, a concept, right? This is a prototype, it works, right? The algorithm could not be the best, but you can do something like this. So technologies like additive manufacturing to me are comparable to the type of, of technology that we're using here, right? This yeah. is, you don't need to wait for the guy to make the plastic mold and to produce the part because that will take a lot of time. You can do that prototype, right? A little bit ugly at the beginning, and then you start putting more and more things until it gets perfect, right? But yeah. it, it works. And that is something that is, uh, to me, a, a breakthrough. So disruptive, right? In a good way. We talk about disruption yeah. as a positive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Disruption to the people, because it's a citizen developer approach. Yeah? So, so maybe not everybody can develop, but 
you know, people who are into this technology, like you, Raul and Gino, you can find enough people to really join you and, and to do yep. the development in these technologies. Yeah. So, and I just had a conversation with one of the, you know, some of these leading uh, ERP players. Um, and they said, nobody will show up for a funeral of an ERP system. Everybody will whine a lot when, when you know, citizen development local tools will, will go to grave. Yeah, so and I think this is, a, this is a nice way of seeing it. So ERP systems are black box for many of us, many of your employees. And, and local automation is, is really something you can embrace and can solve problems, especially in, you know, task force situations we face now. So how do you think no-code platforms help in this whole picture, especially when you consider the goals to make supply chains more resilient and flexible? Yeah, I, I think it, it's, um, it's currently is the core. Uh, we, we have uh, discussed in the, in the previous sections that the big systems are okay to manage the big data or the organization of the data that is being constructed from the supply chain operations, right? But there, these systems are not good to react to the dynamic situation that we're living right now. That's the truth, right? It's not possible to, to challenge those systems to in, integrate these kinds of modules quickly. They're not prepared to do that. So how the load code platform comes into play is, as I mentioned, on comparable to add additive manufacturing, we have something that we can play with. We can uh, create things, we can create a robot that works, right? We can create a prototype and help people quickly. Do you have a problem with logistics? Do, don't, do you, are you doing all this work manually because you have this problem on the logistic costs on the containers? How can you optimize that quickly? How can we teach that instruction to big systems in the companies? It's impossible, right? So we need to create a tool that fits from the system, from the information that is being generated and is creating those decisions quickly for the procurement team. This is what how we can use the low code platforms into this uh, in, in, into this scheme, right? Uh, to me, it's, it's, it's very important to think on the creativity, but very importantly to, to think how can we free up the energy of the people in our procurement organization? Because if you come with another system that basically is asking them to prepare information for the system, they will not use it. We're human, right? We want systems to help us, not systems that we need to maintain. So that intelligence and that kind of algorithms in the area where I'm developing in the company, we're trying always to think in the internal customer. How can we save them time? We learn what they are doing every day repetitive tasks and things like this. And we solve, try to solve that problem. And then we expand it globally. Because we know that that people that teach us that is not the only people in the company. We have two people, 2,000 people in procurement. So they're not alone, right? So other people can benefit from this prototype. And then you enable this collaboration, type of social media collaboration or crowdsourcing, as we call it, some of us. And Martin, what do you do see in your client base? So in my client base, the first and foremost use case for this is really analytics, just because you really try to find the right data points out of your ERP system. You can raise a ticket with your IT department and you can wait for nine months to get an <laughs> answer. <laughs> so, so genius. Good laughing. luck. <laughs> so, so good luck with that. So, so I think analytics on a fast pace, on a task force environment where you need data feeds from different systems, from manufacturing outsourcing systems, from the logistics providers, from your own ERP systems, you need a local platform just to be fast, flexible, and, and, and you put on other nice visualization tools on top you use <laughs> functionalities you have with your local platform, but it's, it's really cool what you can do in terms of analytics with local platforms. And I think in terms of visibility, traceability, 
so, so these are the use cases. I had my teams in my own organization really uh, spending lots of time with our clients to build these things on a very short notice. And building means not six months, not nine months, that meant one or two weeks to build these platforms, to really yeah. be able to react fast. Yeah, yeah it's and amazing how you can develop something in days that used to take years to get an IT organization aligned around. And, and it's true agile, right? Because instead of saying, well, let's specify and let's, let's write everything down and make sure all the stakeholders are aligned, we've moved into, let's just build the app and then see who doesn't like it. <laughs> let's yeah, exactly. something to hate. <laughs> yeah. Because we're humans, right? When you are doing a project at home, you are not, I mean, you are doing some specifications, right? A little bit. Yeah, your, your own if you're lucky, you're right? One stakeholder. But, but then, the, then you 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 see a piece of wood or a, a robot or whatever. You start working, and and what you want is immediately that the robot moves, right? You want to see it, even if it's yeah. very ugly. So, I, I think I think this is the human uh, operation or the, the thinking that we have that we lost with this type of system. They would become so robust, so. Um, if as you mentioned Raul, a black Raul. box, right? Raul, if it can't be done over a long weekend, it's useless for a task force. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And those challenges that we're solving, I mean, you have to solve them unbelievably fast, right? First step, mm -hmm. figure out what data you need. Second step, make it actionable for your team to really, um, to really be able to, to use that data. You know, we've built tools in seven days or less that have solved problems that we've struggled with for years and years and years. And, yeah. and then they just go away and now you're faced with a different problem and a new problem. And what you realize is we want to be attacking the biggest, hardest problems instead of getting stuck on very exactly. simple, very, you know, mindless kinds of things that we should be able to solve very easily. Now, the, it's the, so other, important. the, yeah, the other part is that, and sorry to interrupt you, but the, the, the other very important part is the ideas of the people. There are very mm. brilliant people in the organization that they don't know how to Agreed. do programming, right? And you talk to those people, and brilliant people. I have a lot of expertise from uh, different generations. I, I work with people from, from different generations, and they are brilliant. What they have in their minds is brilliant. And those ideas never got materialized. Right, and it's you. You see, like uh, an algorithm to calculate the cost of a tooling, right? Because we, the, the, the people have the expertise to do that in plastic and say, hey, you, you can be millionaire with that idea, right? If you put it into a digital platform. So, so if we track those ideas and we put a few people programming, you can generate extraordinary things. And and we need to give that power to the people, right? This is like what's happening in social media now. Um, this generation is going to be working with cameras that is following you or stuff like that. And people is very creative, right? I will not see, say the name of the platform, but people is doing creative things that they were not supposed to do. And just because they have a camera is the same with this type of low code platform, right? You can do something, you can test it, you can um, get very bright minds to work with you. And they don't need to, to do the programming. You can do the programming. That's that, that's actually the easy part of the of the equation. The, the expertise well, you, is not. You can replace it, right? Yeah, you can sit with them and you can program at the speed of their thought process, right? So you can yeah. you can actually keep keep the innovation rolling as opposed to getting a single idea out there and then developing it and then going back and asking for the next idea. We can we can run through an entire workflow, a process flow in an afternoon and, and pretty much have something roughed up <laughs> and ready to go and ready to present. And when people see that speed, they start to get a little bit more hope, right? They start to feel like, oh, wait a second, I'm not stuck in a, I'm not just a cog in the wheel anymore. I'm actually able to, to do something that's gonna help us and they get more engaged. And I think that's one of those side effects that is really so interesting to watch as people have that happen. Yeah, and the best ideas are coming from people with expertise, right? Sometimes it's also a myth that uh, older generations uh, are stuck into non-digital stuff. You talk to, to people that has a very good business uh, engineering knowledge, and they say, hey, it will be, I always dream 
of a system where basically is reading this, um, you, you put some sort of drawing and it's reading automatically everything is give me the result that I want because I spent two months doing it. I dream into that. And then you think now it's possible, right? Yeah, Can you tell me, that. you know, do me some schematic, give me one example of what you are doing. And then you do this model. And then you realize that when you finish the model, you can apply to thousands of parts at the same time. And when you present that to that person that has a lot of expertise, people that have 50, 60 year old, right? That was still working. They get interest very quickly. It's not, it's, it's a myth that they are not interested in technology is that they are not exposed to that technology. And it's the same that kids right now, they are growing with the iPads since they have uh, one, yeah. two years old. We were not exposed to that amount of information. So we were not learning as fast as the kids are, 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 are learning right now. You sometimes talk to a kid and say, how do you know that, right? It's the same thing. So because we were not exposed to that technology and that generation were not exposed, they're not used to this kind of development. So we can, we can help them to, you know, to build that bridge into the, into the experience and the innovation. And we build a business system that helps them instead of actually building one that's just a job. <laughs> and one, and one last thing is it's very important <laughs> that we understand the place of this local code platform in the entire scheme, right? Yeah. Local platform will not be able to replace a big ARP system for one reason. And now it's very popular all these dashboards that people is using. It's very easy to do the dashboards in, in BI technology. But is that helping people? Sometimes not. It's just a very, very beautiful dashboard for management, but it took a lot of time to do it. And to refresh it, it's, it's not possible. So I think each part of the pieces of the technology need to fall into place. Right, yeah. now we should not be using one system to replace another. And, yeah. and, and once we understand that we can use those tools effectively. Yeah, I think the great thing about no code though is it helps you tie them all together, right? I mean, it helps you, it helps me fill all the gaps that I find in between the systems. And I don't have to wait for any of the big ERP guys or any of the MRP guys to, to do anything for me. We can just go ahead and fill that gap quickly mm -hmm. and, and find ways to, to bring those things together. I, I was, I was pleasantly surprised a while ago when I was looking at pipelines and saw that they had Microsoft Teams integrations available um, because we use Teams as part of the as part of our response to the pandemic. And now all of a sudden I can have records generating hosts in Teams and have vice versa, have quick pace monitoring Teams channels for for data content. And it just it helps to streamline and automate those processes, which then make people feel like the tools are actually working for them, right? Yeah. Instead, of, instead of being a slave to the tool, they're actually using the tool to do something more and to do something better. And, and that's so important. I do agree. Yeah. yeah. It's incredible to hear these real life uh, implementations and stories. Thank you for sharing. And before we conclude, uh, we talk about uh, the disruptions, uh, what Ha has happened over the last year and challenges and all, but there is one topic we haven't talked about, the environment, and that's really important to me personally. And I'm really wondering um, if you all, all are, as supply chain uh, leaders, still able to push the agenda on environmental programs and what do you do? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, Schneider, um, Schneider Electric, we pushed that. We were uh, the top sustainability company. We received the prize recently from Corporate Knights. And, uh, and it has a lot of, of uh, initiatives like pushing suppliers, 1,000 suppliers, and uh, do all the decarbonization by 2050, right? So it has a lot of initiatives uh, doing that. And this is a perfect example of how we can push the agenda of that internally, because when we start looking into, for example, quantification of materials uh, that I do every day for the, for the project that I'm developing globally, now I can see a picture not only of the tonnage of the material in the product, but also on the inside, on the bill of material you mentioned, you know, like every single composition, you can, you can calculate everything that you require. 
and then you can establish a footprint, right? To effectively, effectively measure what is the impact to the environment into those materials and then focus the team into the 1,000 suppliers that we really require to work on. Sometimes we go with the Pareto analysis, right? Say, oh, the top, the top uh, 1,000 suppliers, maybe it's not the right way. Maybe some of the suppliers that are causing the damage to the environment are not the, one, the top 1,000. So how can we bring that is through analytics. And, and we are, uh, as a part of the architecture that we're building, we are trying to always think on the future of how we're going to use that information, not only for costing, but also for calculating the footprint of, of all of that um, into the environment. Traceability and visibility is what you described, Raul. And this is extremely important, not only if you, if you want to do this for your own company, but also if you want to do this uh, in a broader setup where ESG compliance becomes a national effort, becomes a European or a US effort. Uh, because, I mean, this, is, uh, this pandemic is a crisis which will... Uh, kind of move us for uh, three years in terms of health issues, we move us for maybe 10 years in terms of financial issues we will have as an outcome of this crisis for certain industries, not for all industries. Some are good, some really suffer. And, and, and the climate catastrophe we face and the ESG implications, this is an this is a journey we have in front of us for the next 50, 100 years to, to yeah. get it under control. And traceability, visibility, ESG compliance will be a national effort and European effort and maybe world effort. And, and there will be also some new measurements. Yeah. So if you want to get funded mm -hmm. by public funds as a huge corporation, you have to be ESG compliance. And then it gets even more visible that you yeah. have to do something on your supply chain. You understand where is it coming from? Where does it go? What's the carbon footprint and so on. Uh, so I think this is su super important. And, and maybe some of the technology means we just discussed in a very, I would say, easy manner, uh, getting them really serious and really relevant. Yeah? Right. You know, I, I think the way that, that we see it is maybe a little more uh, present, right, in, in, in our everyday. If I can get people to meet more effectively, I keep them off of airplanes, which certainly helps the environment every day. Um, the, the tools that we're using help us to consolidate and use fewer shipping containers as we're trying to bring stuff from overseas. And if I can go from 75 shipping containers down to 50 shipping containers, that certainly just makes things more efficient. Um, that efficiency is so key in everything that we do and just finding ways to reduce waste and finding ways to, to keep our carbon footprint of, of executing work low. A lot of the technologies we're building already are helping people to do more in a building that's smaller, which is, which is a huge impact on the environment. But the, the cost right, of manufacturing and the carbon footprint of creating all of this equipment and technology is, is significant. And so we have to always find ways to reduce that and, and to just be more efficient with what we do. And I, I will never underestimate the cost of people getting on airplanes to go and, and support these sites because it is, air travel is perhaps one of the biggest areas that we impact on a daily basis. And finding ways that somebody can do their job from a thousand, 2000 miles away um, and not face to face, which unfortunately you still have to do sometimes <laughs> is, is really crucial. That's true. Yeah, and, and adding adding to the to the problem that we're facing now in the pandemic, right? It's uh, people is in a hurry right now. It's, it's, it's doing stuff very quickly, and and people do mistake. We are humans, right? So based on all this hurry of expediting the materials, it's uh, I would say we have more risk of people to create an environmental issue, and we need to be with eyes open, and we need to make sure that we generate this, uh, what I call sentinel tools that are around us to say, hey, hold on, something is, is, is popping up into the system that uh, we're creating a mistake here, right? And, and those little tools, those little bit of catching modes that we have with these type of systems,
can prevent that environment, environment environmental issue, that mistake from, from people in the front line trying to do their work and uh, not noticing maybe that they are creating that impact, right? So, so this type of situation happen and will continue to happen, uh, especially when we are in a hurry situation. So before we wrap up, um, I have one last question. And I am hoping, personally hoping, we are preparing for the past um, pandemic uh, stage. But of course, we are also in an unknown situation. So what are you doing as we more move forward? Uh, do you have any big initiatives or changing changes that are coming up over the next uh, six uh, months or a year? I mean, we're just gonna we're gonna keep trying to get more and more granular with everything that we're doing. We want to know, you know, individual component pieces. It, it's really interesting as I as I think about this. You know, we'll, this this will air in a, in in, a, in the future sometime. And right now, we're dealing with semiconductor shortages. And I think that the thing we're dealing with when this airs will probably be different. <laughs> it won't yeah. be semiconductor shortages anymore. It's going to be something different. And and it's really not that long of a time frame. So finding ways to continue to be agile and to continue to, to really drive uh, reaction time within our business are gonna be key, but also continuing to use the, the tools that are out there today with pipelines and other things to connect our business systems is really what we're doing for the next, um, for the next kind of upcoming phases. Yeah. And from, from my end, I think uh, incorporating machine learning and AI would be key. Uh, we're now integrated big data with uh, with uh, local platforms and it's working pretty well because we work from the from the general to the particular. If we, I think to, I, I like to think about this like a puzzle that is empty and all people is putting pieces in there, and somehow we will get to the goal. Right? But we need to we need to work in little sections that are uh, the most important right now, and those sections may change. Right, so we can build part of the puzzle uh, one day, and then maybe we need to drop it and work in something else. So that is what big data with uh, and analytics with uh, local platform means to me. Now we need to prepare for machine learning. Right, we need help. We get all these data points and and use that technologies to tell us something else, something that we are not seeing with analytics, better algorithms. Um, and, and make sure that we prepare or we give that visibility to the procurement team, that gift, right? That, 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 that we, we dream to have in our career when we were buyers or young people, we were dreaming of this stuff. We need to think on what do you need at that time so that you can do your work effectively and, and, and do a, a superstar, let's say, at that moment that we didn't have. We need to think on that. We, we don't want to be the guys that is maintaining the administrative stuff. We want to be the guys that are disruptive and that are looking at, uh, at what customer wants, internal customer wants, and help them. Because otherwise, no system will survive if that is not driving the, is not driving the, the, um, the transformational change. No, absolutely, Raul. Couldn't agree more. So when we when we saw a bit of adoption before the crisis, a bit of looking into machine learning, just in proof of concepts, MVPs, people got interested into, I think this whole pandemic just gave us, as you know, automation enthusiasts, I would call us, yeah? <laughs> gave us a bit of a boost, yeah? so, so, and, and a bit of, bit of energy. I see increasing level of understanding at the C-suites so all the, not CIOs, they all got it, yeah? So, so they know how to cope with it. But the, the CEOs, the CFOs, COOs, they get the un, really the understanding of the importance of automation, AI, and analytics, the triple A of doing business mm -hmm. nowadays. Uh, so triple A, can we repeat this? Automation, AI? Automation, analytics, and uh, artificial AI. intelligence. Yeah. Okay. So, the triple A of doing business nowadays. So they all got it. Yeah. So 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 triple A in the US is you know helping getting your car off the highway when it broke down. Triple <laughs> A in your business 
is getting your car on the top line of the highway. Yeah? So, so, and I think this understanding is really inhaled by CEOs nowadays because nobody can say, yeah, yeah, you know, we, we can't do this remote. We can't do this with citizen developer teams. We don't know how this will all end. We don't want to create a shadow IT. I think it's time now to really speak up and say, okay, here are the business problems we want to solve. Here is the technology kit. And it's not only local platforms, it's AI, it's some RPA tools, good, good for volume processes. It's a full toolkit of intelligent automation, I would describe it, and, and just use it to solve the biggest problems, yeah? And, and really free up capacity for people working on, on problems in your corporation, because, you know, human beings are good in interpretation, judgment, communication, making decisions, talking to each other, understanding in each other and, and being empathetic. So, so we should just take out the robots out of our human beings and, 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 and yeah. use more of this technology and focus on what matters. No? Oh, and, and in reality, when you look at the young guys coming into the company, we need to realize these guys are faster than us, right? With the very agile and you put something, a problem to solve, they will solve it immediately. Yeah. And, and you compare that to the bureaucracy sometimes of building a system internally and you can compete. Uh, I like to do that kind of stuff. Sometimes I put a, a, a clock, right? And I record the video and, and I say, we can build this stuff in one hour. Yeah. And it's a prototype, right? It's, it's not like it, it, that we need to plan everything. We, for me, it's like, a, like I, I want to blow things, right? In the laboratory and stuff that do not work and take it to the trash and then do it again because it will take me five hours of programming or low code programming. Yeah. Such an interesting point though, right? Because all of these people coming into our organizations at this point, they expect that these things will be this way. Yeah. You know, they've grown up with iPhones and with the internet and with all of these things that is immediately on demand and it feels so um, archaic, right? When they get in and, and they don't have that information available to them right away. Right, and right. A lot of those folks aren't willing to wait. <laughs> They're not willing exactly. to wait. Exactly. So we have, we have all of that uh, expertise that we don't know at our disposal and we are wasting it. If we don't do yeah. it, okay, do that project. I don't know how you do it. Think, look in, in the internet, try to look at videos in the internet. Find it out, right? You, you yeah. will learn something and you are surprised to the result that you are getting. Yeah. You are really, really surprised yeah. and positively surprising. Yeah. And then you have all these meetings where we have PowerPoints and people is building, you know, pitching a project and the plan and everything. Personally, some people is bored about that. The trainings, right? The trainings on, on one hour, two hour trainings. Uh, we want to have five minute training because these young kids, what they want is to click play and they get the information yeah. that they want and they fast forward and they go back, right? And that's it. They probably okay. see one minute effective of the five minute video is how to do the stuff that I need and I don't care about everything else, yeah. right? right. Yeah, that's so true, yeah. Well, so, this is a great conversation. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to have you here today. Again, thanks for your time. Thank you, Tuba. Thank, thank you, you to everyone. Yeah, thank nice. You.